to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. The apostle Paul said, I appeal to Caesar. And to that, Festus said, To Caesar you have appealed, to Caesar you shall go. Acts 25, verses 11 and 12. We welcome you to the final chapters in our study of the book of Acts. We hope that you'll get your Bible handy and stay tuned with us as we think about the climax of this great book in these final chapters. Welcome to the Gospel of Christ program. My name is Ben Bailey, and we're so glad that you've joined us for our broadcast today. Today's lessons are being brought to you by members of the Church of Christ worldwide. Those members of the Church of Christ in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their worship assembly. If you've got a Bible question or there's something you'd like to study, they'd be happy to sit down and study the Word of God together with you. Also, at the Gospel of Christ, we'd love to help you in your study of the Word of God. You can log on to our website, thegospelofchrist.com, and all our Bible study material is free of charge and available to you. If you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson, whether on DVD or CD, we'd love to send that to you. You can fill out a media request form from our website, or you can call us toll-free at one 855 Four five eight three nine zero five. On our website, we have a host of Bible study material, including transcripts, study question, question and answers, and a variety of study materials that would help you in your study of the Word of God. Friend, at the Gospel of Christ, we're concerned about the salvation of souls. That's our main emphasis. We're not concerned about your wallet. We're not concerned about hidden agendas. We just simply want to help men and women know the Word of God and to go to heaven. And so as we transition to our study today, we hope that you'll get your Bible out and have it handy as we're going to look to the Word of God together. In Acts chapter 26, Paul is now going to be before Agrippa, ready to preach the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And I want you to notice the mindset of which Paul approaches his defense of Christianity before this leader who has Paul's hands or Paul's life in his very hands. Look at Acts 26, verse number 2. The Bible records, So Paul stretched out his hand and answered for himself, I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because today I shall answer for myself before you concerning all the things which I'm accused by the Jews. How did Paul feel about standing before this dignitary, this political leader who could snuff out Paul's life if he wanted to? Paul said, I'm happy to be here today to give a defense of my life and of Christianity. You know, as we think about the Apostle Paul, and what made him such a great worker and servant and evangelist for the Lord, Paul looked at it as a joy to speak about Jesus and defend his own life in view of that. Friend, from this we've got to realize, as Christians, we need to find the joy in telling others about the message of Christ. It is not a, it is not a drudgery. It's not a burden. It's not something I have to do or I'm going to go to hell if I don't. Telling others about Christ, it ought to make us happy to do that because we can tell somebody about the best life. Jesus said, I came that you may have life and have it more abundantly, John 10, verse 10. We can tell somebody about the way to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me, John 14, 6. We can tell somebody about the only name under heaven among men by which they can be saved. Acts 4, verse 12. And so when we speak about Christ, it's not, oh, I have to do this or I'm going to be lost. No, I'm happy to speak about Jesus, the one who came from heaven, the one who lived a perfect life among men, the one who made that ultimate sacrifice, and the one who promises, come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, 
I'll give you rest. Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. And so do we really have the joy of Christianity that we ought to have? Paul said, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Now, as you look at Paul's defense, Paul is going to appeal to several things in defense of his life and in defense of Christianity. I want you to notice those with me. Paul begins in Acts chapter 26 in verse 4 stating that he, his character is well known before God and Christ. Look in verse number 4. The apostle Paul says, My manner of life from my youth which was spent from the beginning among my own nation at Jerusalem, all the Jews know. They know me from the first, if they were willing to testify that according to the strictest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. Paul says, you want to get a defense of Christianity in my life? Here it is. You know my life. You know me. You know the way I've lived. You know I've stood four square for the truth. You know, a person's character is a big part of people wanting to listen to the gospel. Would you listen to, if somebody came preaching the gospel and they were a known thief, liar, drunk, or somebody who was immoral, would you be prone to listen to that person? Well, of course not. Whatever they said, you would dismiss almost automatically. What about somebody who has always tried to do right? What about somebody who has gone to great lengths to stand up for what they felt is right and true? Paul said, look at my life. My life is a reflection that I have always tried to do the right thing. How else does Paul defend this? He defends it based on the promise of the fathers in the Scripture. Look at Acts 25 or Acts 26, verses 6 and 7. Paul now says in verse 6, And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers, to this promise our twelve tribes earnestly serving God night and day, hope to attain. For this hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused by the Jews. That promise goes all the way back to Genesis 12, where God said to Abraham, I'll make you a great nation, I'll bless you, and I'll multiply your seed in you, in your seed. All nations of the earth shall be blessed. It, that seed wasn't necessarily Isaac. That seed wasn't necessarily Jacob. That seed wasn't necessarily David. And to your seed, who is Christ. Galatians chapter 3, verses 15 through 17. Paul says, look Agrippa, you know these things. You've heard these things. I'm being judged for the promise made to the fathers, which the scriptures confirm. Second Samuel chapter 7. Verses 12 through 15, God made the promise to David, I'm going to raise one up from your seed. He'll have an everlasting kingdom. All nations will be blessed by him. That seed is identified in the scripture as Jesus. Luke chapter 1, verse 32 through 35. Then Paul mentions uh, not only in his defense, God's power to raise the dead. And he mentions several things, uh, several items. Uh, you've got uh, Elisha, you've got Lazarus, and no doubt you've got Jesus who was resurrected from the dead. He then says, if you think all this is a hoax, look at my life before. I was a persecutor. I was injurious to the cause of Christ. I thought I was doing all those things. But then Christ confronted me. Then I saw the light in essence. I, I had that conversion to Christianity and I realized that was the right way and I was doing things contrary to the teaching of God. Paul's defense is, hey, I've always lived right. I've lived among you people. You know me. Look at the scriptures. They teach this. Look how I tried to live the other way to the best of my ability. And when I saw the truth, I was ready to obey and to do exactly what God said and God wanted me to do. And so when we think about Paul, he illustrates this in such a vivid way, his commitment to the teaching of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to notice next that Paul also mentions in this address to Agrippa the purpose and the power of preaching the gospel. Look in verse number 18. Paul says this in Acts 26, 18, Paul said that God sent them to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among all those who are sanctified by faith in me. What's the purpose of preaching the gospel? To turn people from darkness to light, to help people to see the way so that others can receive the forgiveness of sins. You know, sometimes I think people 
get a bad impression of preaching the gospel. Well, they're just trying to condemn this lifestyle, or they're just trying to make me feel guilty, or they don't want to let us have any fun. No, that's not it. We want to help people to see the light like Paul did. We want people to come out of error and sin and to receive forgiveness of sins and that inheritance which God has promised. It is the, the power of God's Word that's able to do that. The Word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. And thus we must live according to its teaching. James said in James 1.21 that we need to receive with meekness the implanted Word which is able to save our souls. Now, how do people respond to that? Friends, some people, in view of many of the things Paul has said, and in view of the preaching that many do today, of the gospel, of the truth, a lot of people respond by thinking that is sheer insanity and madness. Look at what is said in Acts 26, 24 by Agrippa. Agrippa responds by saying in verse 24, as Paul made his defense, Festus with a loud voice said, Paul, you are beside yourself. Now watch this. Much learning is driving you mad. Here's Agrippa here in gospel. And Festus is there. And Festus, he's had enough. He says, you're beside yourself. You're crazy. Uh, all this learning has made you mad or insane to Festus and to Agrippa and no doubt to Felix whose lives were not being lived according to the teaching of God this was sheer insanity but you know what there was a man in the Bible who at one point was driven mad Mark chapter 5 that man who we know of as legion he had the multiplicity of demons inside him the Bible says that when Christ cleansed him of those demons that man was sitting clothed and in his right mind and that's kind of the opposite of what Festus thinks here. Jesus and the teaching of the gospel doesn't make us mad. Jesus and the teaching of the gospel helps to put us in the right mindset, to focus on heavenly things, to focus on what God wants us to focus on. And of course, Paul, as he responds to this, he says, Most noble Festus, I'm not mad. I'm just preaching the things of the gospel. That soft answer that turns away wrath, Paul uses that no doubt. In Acts chapter 26, verse number 25, but I want you to notice what I think. Agrippa's response, I feel, I think is one of the saddest responses in all of the Scripture. Agrippa's been hearing the Gospel. It's been taught according to the Scriptures. He cannot deny these things. How does he respond? Look at Acts chapter 26, verse number 28. The Bible records, Paul said in verse 27, Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you believe these things. Verse 28. Then Agrippa said, go away for now. Or then Agrippa said to Paul, verse 28, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. Paul says, that's a shame. For I wanted to almost and altogether for you to be as I am, except these chains. You know, I think when Paul heard those words, it had to break his heart. But just imagine Agrippa's mindset. He knew the truth. He had heard these things. He had been raised with a Jewish background in some ways. He could not deny the prophets or what was said here. And he respond, his response is, Almost you persuade me to become a Christian. Friend, I wonder how many people have almost become a Christian. How many people have heard the gospel? How many people have had that prick their hearts? How many people who, even with the, back, the Bible, knew that was right? How many people knew they needed to change their life? How many people knew they were going to stand in judgment for God? And their response is, I'm right at the brink and almost you persuade me to become a Christian. To be almost saved. Someone once said, to be almost saved is to be altogether lost. Friend, almost doesn't do it. Getting close won't help you get to heaven. Just doing a few good things, just living right, or just hearing the gospel preached, that isn't enough. You've got to make that commitment to the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so we ask you to think again personally about your own life. Maybe you've heard the gospel preached. Maybe you know that to be true. Maybe you've been right up at the brink of ready to make that commitment and you're almost there. Wouldn't it be horrible to be almost saved on the day of judgment and to be altogether lost? 
Don't just say almost. Paul said, I, I wish you weren't almost. I wish you were to all together as I am accept these chains. I wish you would make the commitment I have and I wish you'd take me out of these chains in essence, he said. Friend, let's think about our life and let's make sure that we're not almost there. Let's make that firm commitment to serve God and to put our trust in the Almighty so that we can know that we're right in the sight of God. Now, in Acts chapter 27, Agrippa, Festus, and Felix, they're now all going to send Paul, of course, to Rome, to Caesar. And now Paul is in the midst of making that great journey to Rome itself, across the ocean, difficult seas, perilous times, no doubt trial and tribulation will arise. How does Paul deal with the difficulties of that journey? I want you to look in Acts chapter 27, and I want you to notice what the Bible says. Look at Paul's great faith in God in Acts 27, verse 25. The Bible records these words as Paul is in the midst of a great storm. Paul said to the men, Therefore, take heart, men, for I believe God that it will be just as it was told me. An angel appeared to Paul and said, as long as everybody stays on the ship, everything's going to be okay. There'll be no loss of life. They want to throw stuff over. They don't know if they're going to make it. And Paul says, take heart. Be encouraged. I believe God that it'll be just as he told me. Friend, Paul was a great man. We know this from his life. But can you imagine being in the midst of this turbulent sea? Can you imagine in your mind's eye the waves crashing over that boat? Uh, uh, imagine the terror and the heartache in people's life as they don't know whether they're going to sink in the middle of the ocean or not. And Paul receives this vision. No loss of life will occur. What's Paul say? I believe God that it'll be. Now you listen to this. I believe God that it will be just as he told me. Now friend, you talk about faith and an example of faith. That's a powerful example of it. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Paul had heard that. In Acts chapter 9, Paul had seen Christ be with him the whole time from his conversion forward. And now Paul has that faith to say, settle down in essence. It's going to be okay because God said it would be. That's the type of faith that each one of us needs to make it through this life. Listen to these words. John said, the beloved apostle John said, in 1 John chapter 5 verse 4, this is the victory we have even our faith. Victory over the world, victory over sin, victory over problems. If I continue to faithfully trust in God, I can be victorious in the end. Now, as you look at this story, God does care for Paul. In the shipwreck, Paul is taken care of. And friend, when life throws us difficulties, God promises to care for us as well. I want you to look at Acts chapter 27 and notice what the Bible says in verse number 44. The scripture records these words in verse number 44. And the rest, some on boards and some on parts of the ship. Now watch this. And so it was that they all escaped safely to land. Paul said, don't worry. God's going to take care of everybody. He already told me he was. They all get off on the land. The water comes off their clothes. They stand on the beach and they realize Paul was right. They realize more importantly what he said God said was right also. Friend, God took care of Paul. He kept his promises. Even in the midst of the shipwreck that Paul faced, God was there with him. And friend, in the troubles of life, God's going to be with me and you. The Bible says no temptation has overtaken us except such as is common to men. But God is faithful, who with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. 1 Corinthians 10, verse number 13. God said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, so that you may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. What will man do unto me? Let's realize God's not going to abandon his own. Now, we turn our attention to that beach where they have just got out of the water, some on pieces of wood, some on other items, and they're now safe on the beach there. What's going to happen? Well, here, a definite miracle is going to occur to prove the Apostle Paul is a spokesman of God. Now you think about this. Along the way to preach the gospel at Caesar, the ship is broken up. They all make it to land safely. And on this island, 
The gospel is now going to be confirmed. Look in Acts chapter 28 and watch what happens in verses 3 and 6, or 3 through 6. The Bible says, But when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened onto his hand. So when the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, No doubt this man is a murderer whom though he escaped the sea, yet justice does not allow him to live. But watch this. But he shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. However, they were expecting that he would swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But after they'd looked for a long time and so no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said he was a god. Of course, Paul doesn't take that. He doesn't want people to think he's a god. Verses 8 through 10, he will identify this as the power of God. Why the viper? Why Paul getting bit? Why, why this great miracle? To confirm to these natives who have a very odd view about God and punishment to begin with that they need to listen to Paul. Paul's not a God, but he has something to say as a servant of God. You know, any man get bit by a viper, chances are very slim he's going to live. They knew that. They thought this was God's vengeance. No, this is God's servant. Listen up. That's the point of the miracle. Miracles were to confirm the word. Mark chapter 16 verses 18 through 20, and Hebrews chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Now, a lot of the emphasis today is often put on the miracle itself when the miracle is not the main emphasis. The miracle is a big blinking sign to point to someone as a spokesman of God. It's not the miracle that should be the emphasis. It's the message that the miracle pointed to. And Paul's message, of course, is that Christ is the Son of God, that He's the way of salvation, that there is a God, and that we must follow His will and His teaching. And so, as we think about Acts chapter 28, as Paul further journeys on toward, he makes it eventually to Rome, and when they'd appointed Paul a certain day, at his own lodging, uh, to whom he then begins to explain the promises and the teaching of God at the expense with Rome putting the bill. He's now in Rome, a, a prisoner waiting to appeal to Caesar, preaching the gospel. Listen, Acts chapter 28, verse number 23. The Bible says, So when they had appointed him a day, many came to him at his lodging, to whom he explained and solemnly testified of the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus from both the law of Moses and the prophets from morning until evening. Waiting on appeal to look into Caesar's eyes himself and preach the gospel, Paul is taking every opportunity to continue his mission. Then he's got his own place to live, and they give him a platform, give him a day, and Paul allows people to come in. And he preaches the law of Moses, what the law said, what the prophet said concerning Jesus, that he is the Son of God. And he preaches the kingdom of God. Well, Paul, what did you preach about the kingdom? Paul didn't preach the kingdom as a future reality. Paul preached the kingdom in existence. Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, God translated some in the first century out of darkness into the kingdom of His dear Son. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not destroy it. I'm going to give to you the keys of the kingdom. Acts chapter 2, that kingdom was open to the Jews and Peter preached the message of how to get into the kingdom and God added to the church daily those who are being saved. Now, as you think about the preaching of that kingdom, as you bring the book of Acts to a close, I want you to watch how Paul preaches with a firmness the present reality of that kingdom. Look at Acts 28, verses 30 and 31. The Bible says, Then Paul dwelt two whole years in his own rented house and received all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no one forbidding him. Now again, you imagine this. Rome's paying to get Paul uh, to Rome and appeal to Caesar. Paul's got his own rented place and in Rome waiting to appeal for two years. He's preaching the gospel. Imagine the good. By these, what some would see as tribulation and difficulty and persecution, look at the mass amount of good that came because of that. And here's Paul preaching the kingdom of God as a present reality. 
that people could obey, could become Christians, and could learn how to do the work and the will of Almighty God. Now, friend, as you think about the book of Acts in totality, God made the promise to these servants of His in this book. You'll be my witnesses in Judea, Jerusalem, Samaria, even to the uttermost parts of the world. We saw Judea with the apostles. We saw Jerusalem with the preaching apostles, Samaria. Philip goes down to Samaria. And then from the conversion of Saul to Paul all the way to Rome itself, what we think of as the uttermost parts of the world, the gospel is definitely preached. Friend, as you think about this practical application, let's realize God expects His people, wants His people to spread that message as far and as wide as we possibly can. Maybe today you're hearing for the very first time about Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Listen carefully. God so loved the world he gave His only begotten Son, the Scripture says in John 3.16. Jesus, the Son of God, left heaven. 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9. He came to, the, to this earth to be the Savior of the world. Matthew 1 verses 19 through 21. He lived a perfect life, tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. And His life came to a, a blockbuster or a climax by Him giving Himself as a sacrifice. Listen to these words. He Himself bore our sins in His own body upon the tree, that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes we are healed. He gave His life so that you could live forever with God. Friend, have you taken advantage of that? Do you believe that Jesus is God's Son, the Savior of the world? Do you believe it to the point that you'd make a commitment to turn from sin, change your life and repent, having heard the Word, believed in Jesus and repented? Would you confess Jesus as the Savior of the world and Son of God? And would you be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins? Listen to what Peter said. On that very first sermon on the day of Pentecost, Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. If, if you're hearing the message today, regardless of where you are in the world and you need to obey the gospel, friend, we're urging you to do that. Don't wait till tomorrow. Don't say almost or a more convenient time. Obey now what you know now and you can become a child of God. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the gospel through TV, radio, and internet. Our motto is to take the whole gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905, or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.